Hi everyone, we are Team 112. My name is Henry Bay. My name is Chemin Jen. My name is Manas Popo. We're tackling problem B, birds and bicycles. Here's a big table of contents and I will summarize it right here. We seek to explain the problem clearly and concisely and apply the natural assumptions. We show how the general model follows from these assumptions and we reduce the model into an idealized case for sanity checking. And then we demonstrate the model with some simulations and we conclude with a discussion on the initial conditions and some limitations. So a viral video shows a bird perch on a bicycle wheel able to move itself so the wheel spins. Our task is to model this phenomenon with a small apparatus attached to the wheel able to move the mass to generate the extra motion. So our apparatus would consist of a small piston that is capable of moving the mass radially outward or inward and it may be imparted with the initial angular displacement or velocity from some initial lateral movement. This would be from the bird leaning at the start of the motion and it satisfies the initial condition to be used later in the initial angular position and angular velocity, which is great news. Now we have a numerical simulation that shows uh, the motion of the bird, and this will be used later in the final case where we have the air resistance, friction, and gravity. Now we go to the kinematics, and we have linear velocity v, which is equal to the radius function, times the theta dot, which is the angular velocity, and the angular position is just theta of t, and the coordinate at the center of the mass is, is sine theta for the x-coordinate and the cosine theta for the y-coordinate. The reason being is that we start from the vertical axis, and our theta is simply the radius function that is distance um, from the axle to the center of mass, and we will discuss this later. And our bicycle wheel and the apparatus represents a rigid body. This is where we go to the dynamic section. And when we think of the rotation of motion, we think of the Newton's second law of motion, um, an analogy of that. And this represents the torque, and I is the moment of inertia, and alpha is the regular um, angular acceleration of theta double dot with respect to time t. And zero is actually a zero vector, since it arises from a cross product. And the time our piston moves between state has negligible impact on the motion, which we will talk about later with the heavy side function. This is the free body diagram. So the, fr the force of friction and the force of air resistance is tangential to the motion, but the force of gravity is always pointing downwards. And we have the theta here, we represented this as the start of the motion. And in this case, it is the, it is the piston that is retracted. And this is a rare case when the force of gravity and the force of air resistance has the same direction. Now, in that last bit, we had a nice cross product sum, which is actually pretty messy but it was equal to the zero vector, which is the only vector uniquely determined by its magnitude of zero. So we want to work to a sailor uh, equation of forces with friction, air resistance, and gravity. So torques, we know magnitude of torque is the magnitude of the force, magnitude of the radius, and then the sine of the angle, which as we saw for tangential, like friction, air resistance, is just equal to force times radius magnitudes. Gravity will have a sine component as we'll see. So we're gonna write it, we got a sum of torques, magnitudes and sine representing the direction, right? So gravity will contribute to our motion, but friction and air resistance will go against our motion. Alpha magnitude is just magnitude of the angular acceleration. So now let's start with the air resistance. We're gonna assume this is proportional to velocity squared, pretty standard, and we're gonna translate from linear velocity to angular velocity like so. And similarly with friction, also proportional to velocity squared because it comes from the centripetal uh, force. Sorry about that. Again, we go from linear velocity to angular velocity. Moment of inertia times the angular acceleration just stays the same. We have to that. But gravity, torque of gravity, has that sine theta component like we discussed, so that's state that is. Now we combine all, all our terms to get this autonomous second order nonlinear and homogeneous differential equation. A very complex system that obviously we can't solve analytically. But we can simplify it a bit because I, the moment of inertia, is mass times the radius squared. So we can bring in that radius function and try and eliminate this because every term has a radius that's not zero and reduce our slightly complex system to a still complex system. <laughs> but if we were to maximize the radius, that would represent a variational problem. Very difficult and impossible for us to do. So instead, we're going to come up with the defined radius of a heavy side function, meaning we extend at the start and then contract halfway through. So get that nice heavy side piecewise and now we're going to reduce this to an ideal case because the friction and air resistance are both really small and we kind of like ignore them for an idealized version 
but we should note that without damping, the velocity is going to increase without bound. So ignoring those middle terms, we can get to here, and with non-zero masses, we can eliminate them both and get this for our, and our ideal model, depending on the radius, angular acceleration, gravity, and ascending angle. And here I'll be introducing our numerical solution. And we have carefully chose several constants and coefficients. We've chosen R1 as 0.7 meters because it's as big as, uh, large as models by the bicycle wheel. It's a standard 27 inches wide bicycle. Um, and we selected K over here. We can see here it was the unit. That's because we have also counted with the geometry's uh, data. And here we have the initial velocity and initial position for our simulation. And the reason why we have a really large initial angular velocity, that is because uh, at that point we found out that it shows a really big convergence. So it's for demonstration. And since our uh, differential equation is a second order ODE, so we adopted a fourth order Ron Kikata scheme to calculate our solution. And here you can see some of the initial results you see two lines over here. There's the, the red line, represent the ideal case. And the blue line re represent the real case. And we can see the blue line is kind of legged off. That's because due to the effect of uh, air resistance and friction. And the left, on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a cosine theta and versus time frame. This is just to demonstration uh, for the frequency of the rotation. And next, a longer thing. And here, for the time domain, we have uh, expanded from zero to two second to zero to four second, and to show a better uh, represent representation for the convergence. And also, we can see here, or uh, real case actually passes at maximum speed due to uh, a balance of the friction and our resistance. Now, depending on those initial conditions, which you kind of cooked up to get that nice picture at the end there, we're going to get we're going to observe something different. But it was still a nice sanity check for us to see that our models did kind of match what we expected to happen, right? The ideal case did blow up, and then our real case did kind of slow down, which matched what we thought. But when we predict longer intervals, our numerical scheme is also going to introduce some error because it is a fourth order wrong cut it. So. We're not sure if those differences come from physical error or from our numerical error. Now, we're going to try and find the maximum speed that we get. So first we need to assume that happens, meaning the second derivative is zero, or it's on the boundary. So the second derivative is zero, we can go through our equation of angular velocity and go through and solve for that. To convert to linear velocity, we need to introduce the radius factor, and then go through and find this expression for the linear velocity, which with our initial conditions, turns out to be a very high 16 meters per second, which comes from our high initial velocity and also because of our low dampening factors. Now with higher dampening, we would get a lower velocity, which makes sense, but also with no dampening, like our ideal case, we would have an unbounded case, which leads into bounded con boundary conditions because on the right boundary is unbounded, nothing to say there. Left boundary is initial condition territory, so depends on your initial velocity. But one thing to notice was we had to assume that this occurred, meaning the second order was zero. If it didn't occur, like in the ideal case, it's just unbounded, and we have no maximum, and this quantity wouldn't make sense. So on some initial conditions, if we start at the bottom, we can still kind of recover motion with a very high initial grip, like eight radians per second, so very fast. But we still get the nice motion with the difference, and we still get the same frequency ideas from the previous curves, but still, very high initial condition. With no initial velocity, we get no movement. Uh, in other case. So we either start at the center, no movement at the top, or we have some slight offset, and we can recover movement for a bit, but you'll see we reach an angular peak. So then we come back to the start. Not very interesting. All right, to summarize the whole thing, so we set out to model the motion of the bird with the bicycle wheel, and we found that with a given radius function, we can keep it spinning with an increasing speed in the ideal condition. And depending on the initial condition, we may not be able to complete a rotation due to a lack of rotational velocity. We also found the expression for maximum speed, and we also sanity checked the model with numerical simulations. The limitation we found was with the heavy side function, the bird does not move in very rigid motions, so we are not able to account for those scenarios.
And at the end, a very special thank you to our coach, Anthony Statham, and every single reviewer and our judges. Thank you very much.